Median age of diagnosis is 73, and it's much more common in Caucasians than any other ethnic group. <clears throat> Tobacco smoke uh, is the most common cause of uh, bladder cancer. Uh, the attributable risk uh, with smoking is about 50 to 60%. And for a current smoker, the relative risk of development of bladder cancer is four, and a former smoker is two. So two things that come out of this. One is, is that smoking is uh, the primary driving factor of bladder cancer development in most patients. And that by quitting smoking, uh, the risk of development of bladder cancer, as well as the survival of bladder cancer, which I'll go over in a little bit, is improved. So still important to counsel patients on the importance of smoking cessation, even after they've been diagnosed with bladder cancer. <clears throat> Uh, the more patients smoke, the increased risk of development of bladder cancer, development of high-grade, high-stage bladder cancer, and then, as I said previously, the risk of recurrence and progression um, even after bladder cancer diagnosis. Certain occupational exposures are associated with bladder cancer, so metal processing, the use of aromatic amines or aromatic dyes, uh, arsenic, <clears throat> um, infectious organisms specifically, schistosomiasis and then chronic UTIs and the development of squamous cell carcinoma. And that's primarily because of this chronic inflammatory state that they cause. Uh, aristocolic acid, pretty rare uh, in the United States, but seen in, in some Eastern European countries and it can cause uh, bulk and nephropathy, usually due to contaminated grain products. Uh, certain drugs, so phenacetin and then uh, specifically cyclophosphamide, and iphosphamide, which um, is the most common thing that we see. Uh, these components are metabolized to something called acrolin, uh, which again causes a strong inflammatory reaction in the bladder, increases the risk of development of bladder cancer. So these should be coupled with mesna, uh, which protects the uh, bladder lining uh, from exposure to the acrolin uh, product. Uh, pelvic radiation for something else, so cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, um, especially um, radiation that was done uh, prior to IMRT, uh, where you have an increased uh, radiation field uh, to surrounding uh, structures. And that's uh, radiation to the bladder certainly can increase the risk of development of bladder cancer in the future. Some genetic syndromes are associated with bladder cancer. All of these are autosomal dominant. So Lynch syndrome, Pusiegers, Cowden, Leaf Romani, Costello, neurofibromatosis. Um, obviously, you know, any mutations in, in uh, um, uh, major genetic components such as P53 all can increase your risk of uh, bladder cancer development. Uh, hematuria is the most common presenting uh, symptom and, and a patient that that presents to your office with gross hematuria, the risk of, uh, of identification of bladder cancer is somewhere between 13 and 35%. And with microscopic hematuria, it's 0.5 to 10%. I usually counsel patients about 2% risk with microscopic hematuria, 25 to 30% risk with gross hematuria. The other, the other thing to keep in mind is that patients may present with irritative voiding symptoms alone without hematuria. And so this is commonly seen in patients that have a missed diagnosis of bladder cancer. Um, so patients with CIS typically present only with irritative voiding symptoms, actually up to 80% of them don't have any hematuria or other signs and symptoms. Um, this can be frequency, urgency, dysuria, nocturia. Um, and obviously these things can be seen with many other urologic diagnoses. So in men, this is commonly attributed to BPH in women to recurrent UTIs. And so these patients go along for years and years, don't really get any further workup, aren't scoped. Um, and have these undiagnosed bladder cancers. And so just something to keep in mind, if you've got a patient with severe irritated voiding symptoms, you treat them as you otherwise would for their LUTs, you don't have the expected response, make sure you keep it in the back of your mind. Um, at some point, probably should scope these patients and make sure that there's not something else going on there. Cystoscopy is the first and most important evaluation in patients with hematuria or suspected bladder cancer. And this is because it allows us to uh, visually inspect the lining of the bladder and identify these tumors. There's two types of uh, cystoscopy that we can perform. One is white light cystoscopy, which is the vast majority of cystoscopy that we do. It's readily available. Um, we're able to do these in the office. Um, this is your standard cystoscopy. It allows us to visualize everything from the urethra uh, to the lining of the bladder, as well as the uh, ureteral orifices. And uh, most tumors can be visualized on white light. The the hard thing can be to, to identify these little tiny tumors, CIS, differentiate between just bladder wall erythema uh, and CIS disease. And so blue light cystoscopy can help in that process. And so it's commonly used in patients uh, 
uh, with a history of bladder cancer when assessing for recurrences, positive cytologies, but also can be used in the initial evaluation if you're not sure uh, of what you're looking at. And, and blue light cystoscopy basically uses a uh, specific compound called cisview or hexaminolivalenic acid uh, that aids in the identification of uh, tumors. It's taken, it's instilled into the bladder with a uh, catheter preoperatively and then is taken up by those tumor cells. And then after about 45 minutes to an hour, you can see the difference here on the right side, what those cells look like. They light up fluorescent pink. <clears throat> urine cytology has a high specificity for identification of high-grade urothelial carcinomas. It's relatively low sensitivity for low-grade tumors. It's typically used as an adjunct in bladder cancer diagnosis and actually more so in bladder cancer surveillance. It's not recommended to be done with your standard hematuria workup. And this is because you end up with a lot of atypical cells and patients that have hematuria for other reasons. Um, it can be difficult to differentiate what those cytologies mean. And so um, not something that you should do in your routine workup, but something to keep in mind may be helpful in monitoring for recurrence in patients that are already diagnosed with bladder cancer. Um, there are several urine-based tumor markers that can be used, NMP21 and FISH. Again, these are not recommended in the work of hematuria. We do occasionally use them in the surveillance of patients with bladder cancer or to assess for treatment response, specifically in patients that are FISH positive. Um, if you give them BCG and they turn FISH negative, um, then you, have, you feel pretty good about um, kind of what's your, treat your treatment response with that medication. Um, and any patient that's diagnosed with bladder cancer, <clears throat> you, you want to get um, good cross-sectional imaging uh, of the upper tracts, and that can go to the CT urogram, MR urogram, and retrograde polygrams. And these are all important components of the initial gross hematuria or high-risk microscopic hematuria workup. Um, and this allows for the identification of other potential sources of hematuria, as well as to evaluate the lining of the ureter and renal pelvis, because all of this, this uh, the, the upper tracts are lined by the same cells that the bladder is. And like I said, this tends to be a field defect. And so if you've got tumors in the bladder, it's also possible that you've got stuff high rep. And so you want to make sure you're not missing anything. 